Terror strikes Ohio State, the response and the fallout. Joining us this week for Columbus on the Record, Kathy Kandiski, State House reporter for the Columbus Dispatch. Karen Kassler, State House Bureau Chief for Ohio Public Radio and TV. Ray Miller, publisher of the Columbus African American News Journal. And Mark Weaver, Republican strategist. What appears to be a lone wolf attack inspired by the Islamic State terrorized the Ohio State campus this week. The attack came Monday morning, hours after students returned from Thanksgiving break. A man drove his car up onto the sidewalk in the heart of campus, striking several people. He then got out of the car and slashed or stabbed bystanders before being shot and killed by an OSU police officer who happened to be in the area. OSU immediately issued an alert and locked down the campus for 90 minutes. In the end, 11 people were hurt, but none of the victims died. Do what we can to be as safe as we possibly can, and we all have the normal safety protocols in place, and we all live uh, uh, with the fear that things like this can happen to us. And so but by being diligent and focusing, we believe we can be as safe as possible. And, and again, with our safety personnel and officers here to respond and help protect us, we're pleased that this was no uh, more serious than it could have been. The suspect is identified as Abdul Rasak Ali Artan, an OSU student and Somali refugee with permanent legal status in the U.S. Investigators say while he was not in contact with ISIS, he may have been inspired by the terrorist group. Karen Kessler, preparation, quick action, and just plain luck really helped respond, helped OSU respond to this crisis, really with, you know, all things considered, the best possible result. Right, I think that that's been the overwhelming reaction is that uh, th there's praise for the first responders and you know with OSU being in an urban setting you had a lot of first responders available but also the whole system that alerted students and told students how to react to something like this. I think there was a lot of credit given to students to pay attention to that and react to it and of course that was the alert that we in the media got which set off a little bit of confusion because we at first were told it was an active shooter situation. We got that from Ohio State and then later on found out that it was actually the situation involving the car and the butcher knife. And, and so the story definitely changed. But I think there's a lot of credit that's being given to a lot of different people. OSU officials, Kathy, have said that the active shooter label came because there were shots fired. Correct. Turns out they were, they were likely from the police officer, but they were, they were getting right. reports of shots being fired. They didn't know if there was more than one person at well, the time. Well, you know, one thing you can count on when situations like this occur is that the first word you get is usually not the, the last word you get. It's usually... So they were acting on the best information they had at the time. Of course, they wanted to be diligent. Had they not put that out, they would have been criticized for not warning students that there could have been a gunman on, on campus. So I, I, I think all in all, the response was really good. One thing that really heartened me, I've worked on a lot of active shooter scenarios for different clients around the country, and the run, hide, fight scenario is the best practice in a, in a campus shooting. And so the fact that they led with that in their alert tells me that they had thought about this they have the resources in place, and we can quarrel with whether or not there was truly an active shooter. I'm glad they put out that alert. Ray Miller, I mean, the, the Ohio State University Police, they've been preaching this. Actually, WOSU helped produce yes. a video for them with that run, hide, fight. And it, the message gets out there, and people did just that. Yeah, to add to what's been said, I, I was also very impressed with uh, how the city uh, coordinated, both uh, the police department as well as the fire department. Uh, fire division of the city and how uh, the mayor showed up and all of that. So it was it was good coordination, good support uh, to uh, put an end to something that was uh, uh, truly tragic, as you said. Yeah. Right. Uh, one thing that I've heard too, uh, since you've had people all over the state who attend Ohio State, uh, that parents who were in different parts of the state say that they felt like they were being informed as well. Ohio State sometimes gets a reputation of, of locking down information and not being as open as maybe they could be. But this was a case where the information was coming out as fast as seemed like as it was available. And I think a lot of parents and people who were outside the Ohio State community who were wondering what was going on were feeling like they were being informed. Well, President Drake mentioned on Ann Fisher's radio show this week that they learned from the incident that happened about a year ago where the man went into the Wexner Arts Center and shot up a bunch of uh, paintings and they were a little slow to say active shooter, even though that incident was over in like 10 or 15 minutes because the, the man took his own life. They learned from that and they didn't, they didn't hesitate. 
But the danger always is crying wolf. You don't think that there's a, there's a chance of that I don't think there's been here. enough of these for people to worry about mm -hmm. crying wolf. And, and if they do it when they think it's necessary, students will learn that this is the time to do it and learn what to do it. And we saw wonderful examples of students, particularly those with military backgrounds, stepping up to help fellow students. It was a great story for Ohio State. It was a tragic situation, but the reaction, I think, goes to Ohio State's credit. The officer, uh, Alan Horochko, fairly new to the OSU Police Department, I think less than two years. An Ohio State graduate. Yeah, uh, justified actions. All accounts, people say that he had no choice. Any questions with how he acted? In the, the, ending in the fatality of the... No, the, classic Ohio yeah. law is when you see someone who's a threat to yourself or somebody else, you have the right to use deadly force, whether you're a citizen or a police officer. Yeah. I think he made the right decision. Moving you know, Time didn't really permit us to get into this, uh, but I, I think rather than looking at ISIS and that kind of thing, to really look at mental health. Yeah. Uh, and that's what we really don't have enough time to talk about. Uh, well, we'll get into that a little bit. Do you, I mean, all the witness accounts that we've seen right now say that this young man was doing well. He had That's graduated right. with good grades from Columbus State, transferred to Ohio State. One interview it seemed to show he was having a hard time adjusting, but it was very early. What happened? Is there any way to prevent this from happening? Yeah, I, I think that there is. Um, you know, too often those in leadership positions, whether it's an educator uh, in the classroom or whether it's an administrator, they see something that's wrong and they say, you know, young man's got a problem and they do nothing about it. Um, I can think about my own situation when, when my brother died when I was in school. I was a great student and then all of a sudden grades tanked and no one said not a word about it. Now I'm sitting in the back of the auditorium as opposed to sitting in the front like I normally do uh, and no one said a, a word. Well, in this case, though, this is a young man who had all gone online and shown grievances with how Muslims are treated in America. I don't know that legally we could have done anything because that is protected political speech, but we cannot ignore as a country the fact that ISIS uses the Internet to recruit people who on their own will take jihad and go out and commit these acts. And so I, I think we cannot, certainly there's a mental health component, but we sure cannot is. understate the, the goal of ISIS to try to get American students who have, a, American young people who have a grievance with America to act on it. Add in the fact that there might be some mental illness issues going oh, sure. on. And, looking to recruit vul people who are vulnerable sure. to be recruited for that kind of thing, I think is the point yes, that Ray's trying to make. Donald Trump, we'll get to him in a moment, but he said that this person should not have been allowed into the U.S. I mean, he was a refugee. The U.S. takes in refugees. The screening process is fairly vigorous, despite what politicians say and what it's during this campaign. Karen, I mean, how, how do you say no because you are from Somalia, you can't come in? Well, and that whole idea of being uh, from Somalia, we've got a pretty big Somali community here, and I think there's a lot of fear of people in that community that there's going to be a backlash. And to Donald Trump's statement, he didn't mention his Somali heritage, but I think there's a real worry that, you know, 20 or 30,000 people, the second largest Somali population in the country here in Columbus, is very worried. And, and you know, there's certainly something to be concerned about there. Well, Mike, you said, how can we do it? Remember, legally, America can decide who comes in and yeah. who can't. There's, there's no legal impediment to it. It's a policy question for our leaders to decide. And there are millions of people around this world who want to come to America. The question for America is, which ones will give us the best citizens who can be industrious, productive, and help us grow as a country? And then the, how do you spot or monitor? Because there have been instances, particularly in Minnesota, where Somali immigrants have been recruited to go mm -hmm. to fight in Syria, in Iraq, and, and with, with Muslim That's extremists there. To say, how do we control Donald Trump? Uh, well, we'll get to that topic three. Which is an impossibility. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't that some of what the extreme vetting that he had yeah. talked about was going to supposedly deal with? Yeah, we'll see. All right, that story will continue. Congressman Tim Ryan of Youngstown fell short in his long shot bid to unseat Nancy Pelosi as House Democratic leader. Although his challenge failed, Ryan did manage to capture nearly one third of the Democratic caucus votes. Many of you have heard me say this. Uh, a million times in the last two weeks, and I believe it in my heart that if we're going to win as Democrats, we need to have an economic message that resonates in every corner of this country. I'm disappointed because I like to win, and, uh, but I think it was a great discussion for us, and I think, honestly, I think the party is better off. Despite the loss, Ryan's high-profile effort could indicate a desire to make a statewide run in 2018. We'll get to that in a moment, Ray Miller, but... Nancy Pelosi, Democrats have been reeling 
why is she still the Democratic leader in Congress? Well, it's also structure. You know, you, the districts are gerrymandered at, at the uh, federal level as well as at the state level. It's very difficult to pick up seats. Um, you, you've got to go out and raise money against the majority that has uh, an advantage there. Uh, and then you've got these districts that just as Tim Ryan's district is probably 75, 80 percent uh, Democratic. Um, that's uh, why he's been able to be there. Um, I think he's been listening to the sound of one hand clapping uh, just a bit too much. And um, it may sound like a lot to have one third of the votes, but when you've got 188 people in your caucus and you pick up 60 some, um, you know, hell has no fury like a woman who's kind of like ticked off at you. Mm -hmm. And uh, the speaker, uh, or the, the, uh, the leader, uh, Pelosi, uh, I think she'll probably uh, exact a little punishment from Tim. But doesn't doesn't he have a point, Mark? That I mean, he, she pointed out that Donald Trump won Tim Ryan's district. That yeah. The Democrats are not connecting, at least on that presidential level, with those white working class. Well, voters. let's remember that the, less than a decade ago, the Democrats did control the House. She was the Speaker of the House yeah. uh, for much of the 20th century. The Democrats had a lock on Congress, and so when you look at the map of where Trump uh, won and where Hillary Clinton, where they got their votes, the Democratic Party has become an urban party and a party of the coasts. And until they can do what, ironically, what Tim Ryan is saying, which is win people in the heart line and address the white working population, they will continue to struggle. And Nancy Pelosi is the wrong messenger. Whether Tim Ryan's or not, I'm not sure. But Nancy Pelosi is the wrong messenger. But you're not saying that the districts aren't gerrymandered. And, I think and because every party they're so badly fights gerrymandered. to get their yeah. party get more seats. And I think that's been true since Eldridge Jerry. The original gerrymander has yeah. been around in the 1700s. But it's, it's yeah. really on steroids now because of computers and you really can really get these maps to almost to the That's vacant right. lot level gerrymandered for each party and yeah. Republicans in Ohio took advantage of it as Democrats did in other states I'm sure yeah was Tim Ryan just too soon was it too soon caring for him he's too not enough seniority I think he's there was the suggestion that he was the guy that's talked about it but never pulled the trigger. Well, this time he pulled the trigger. And uh, he got 20 more votes than the person who challenged Nancy Pelosi in 2010. So I think he feels like, as you heard in the bite, that he, he got a little bit of a victory here. Uh, but, you know, the question now is what does this do for Tim Ryan? Because certainly it raises his profile. Is he, as you hinted, thinking about running in 2018. He's been, he was talked about in 2014 as a possible candidate for governor. And uh, this week, State Senator, uh, Senate Minority Leader Joe Schiavone, who's from uh, Ryan's district, said that he wants to run for governor. So this could be very interesting. So Kathy, does Tim Ryan, who has been talked about statewide before, does right. he pull the trigger on that this time? I, I would not be surprised. I mean, I, he's indicated many, many times that he's interested in, in higher pursuits. And let's look around. Who, where are the Democrats going to go in Ohio? Who do they have? He's a, he's a good candidate. I mean, he, he's a potentially good well, candidate. I will say this, though. If, the, if Joe Schiavone and Tim Ryan, both of the Youngstown area, are the top Democrat candidates in 2018, it will be a Republican year in 2018 because that is not a very deep bench. Ray, who is... I who is your choice? I agree with you. <laughs> I totally Ray, agree, for you. I totally I agree with you. Yeah, and throw a, a, a couple of Richard the others Cordray. from the valley in there as well. Um, you, you know, you look at the quality of the elected official. Uh, we just had Rick Pfeiffer who said, I'm not going to, to run again. City attorney uh, for so, the city yeah, of Columbus. So, so Rick was, you know, a, an outstanding elected official because he was smart, because he was engaged in the community, because he had uh, accomplishments on the policy level. Uh, he was um, mentoring young people. He was doing all kinds of positive things that you should do. You think about Tim Ryan, and then you say what? Tim Ryan wants to be and why? Based on what? And what, what are his major accomplishments? Uh, I think he's a fine young man uh, and who's been very lucky, quite frankly, uh, in politics from the day that he stepped in. You know, it's not that difficult to succeed Jim Traffic. So who's, your, who's your pick then? It's, that campaign will start in the for next six months for governor in 2018. Oh, I haven't, even thought, I haven't even thought about governor uh, in terms of, you know, who our candidate might be. I just hope it's not Ted Strickland. Well, look at the Republicans. <laughs> the Republicans have at least four major names, right? Mike DeWine, John Husted, Mary Taylor, Jim Renacci, at least four who are vying for that job. The Republican bench in Ohio was very deep. The Democrats are facing an existential crisis in Ohio. They're quickly going to become the Washington generals 
of politics because the, they're going to lose time and time well, again well, to the heart well, of the globe. You, you could also point to whatever happens in Washington could affect what happens in 2018. True. When you talk about the Republican bench being deep, look what happened in 2006 yes. when uh, Jim Petro and Ken Block were both running for governor and Ted Strickland ended up burying Blackwell in a landslide. It's possible. Right. Lots right. can change. Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and the 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 uh, bench was very very deep for the presidency. It was. And who won? Well, at least on the Republican side, it was. But who did Democrats look to? I mean, you mentioned Rich Cordray, but he's run statewide before and lost. Yes. I think there there are some big city mayors. It was suggested to me by former Republican Party Chair Kevin DeWine that maybe that's where the candidates come from is is the big city mayors. But mm -hmm. they would have to want to run. Maybe so there is that. It truly, it truly may be an unorthodox candidate. Jerry Springer, not a part of. Please no. But, you know, not a part <laughs> of the Ray Democratic system. Ray has only talked about who he doesn't want. Uh, okay. <laughs> I don't, Actually, I would like Jerry Springer to run as a Democrat. Donald Trump. I'm sure you would. Let's put it this way: Donald Trump Jerry is the president-elect of the United States. I'm not ruling anything out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right. Speaking of the president-elect, he told workers in Ohio and the Midwest he would keep jobs from moving out of the country. Well, even before he takes office, Trump has come through on part of that promise, convincing Carrier Corporation from moving some of its Indianapolis operations to Mexico. So many people in the other, that big, big, beautiful plant behind us, which will be even more beautiful in about seven months from now. They're so happy they're going to have a great Christmas. That's most important. But also, I just want to let all of the other companies know that we're going to do great things for business. There's no reason for them to leave anymore. Three jobs Here's there. the deal. Another Carrier's parent corporation. Here's the deal. Carrier's parent company gets $7 million in tax break. The company promises to invest $16 million in the Indiana plant, which will stay open, keeping 800 jobs. 300 related jobs are saved but 600 jobs still move to Mexico. Some estimates have that uh, number a bit higher than 600. Mark Weaver, is this a good deal? We have seen in the last week what Donald Trump's presidency will look like. He came in and did something that movement conservatives would oppose. They would oppose these incentives, and he's willing to show people that he's going to do things that he thinks are practical and that appeal to a populist bent and not necessarily the true conservative wing of the Republican Party. I think this will be classic Trump administration stuff. Long term, is this good for American business and the American worker? This type of deal. It, it depends on how you look at it. I, I'm a free trader. He's not. And so I would disagree with him on trade. But there's a lot of people who like that approach. They say, be darn with your free market ideology. Get me stuff that works. I think that's the approach he's going to take. And I think that the people who elected him will like this a lot. Why not ask for all the jobs to stay in Indiana? Well, and that's the argument against it, right? The argument is how much, how many companies can you save? And where is this one was high profile? If for no other reason somebody caught video of the reaction of the workers yeah. when they were being told that their jobs were moving to Mexico. And your vice president is governor of the yes. state where so it was, it's sitting governor. The stars align yeah. in a certain way. Mm -hmm. But if, having said that, when's the last time we had a president-elect put together a deal that saved a bunch of people before they took office? It's a rare thing. But this, I think this is the way he wants to operate. I mean, this is like his comfort zone. This is yes. you know this one-on-one -on -one negotiation type, type situation. And I think this is what we're going to see a lot more of yeah, from I him. I think it's a bit of theater, quite a bit of theater, uh, as opposed to economic development policy and strategy uh, on his part as well, uh, and particularly with uh, Steve Bannon as his primary um, uh, advisor in the White House uh, when, once he gets there. Um, you're going to have somebody who's all about creating movies and creating theater, and that's uh, essentially what Bannon has done. Karen, this is what mayors do all the time. Governors do all the time. They make a deal, give a tax break, keep jobs here, or bring jobs here. It's, but it's the president doing it now. Well, and I, I wonder how many other companies, how many other states, how many other communities are going to expect the same treatment when their big employer leaves or their or threatens to leave. And the other thing I wanted to ask Mark, the whole idea of government picking winners and losers, isn't this exactly government picking winners and losers, which Republicans say they don't like? It is. It's why movement conservatives will oppose this, but populism speaks to a different group of voters, and they roared this election. They came out and said, we will be heard. We want more of this. And I'm more of a free market person, and so I don't know that I would have done it this way, but I understand why he did. And the mayors and governors that you're talking about, Mike, who'd make these deals, they are typically very popular for doing so. 
But do. you see school districts lose money. You see, look at Kansas, what there, what's going on mm -hmm. there, that they're deeply in the red, the state budget there, and, and is it there has any no consequence. Is there any guarantee, too, that these companies stay? I mean, we've heard about tax incentives that have been given to companies, and as soon as they're gone, the companies leave. I mean, is there any guarantee that Carrier stays after this deal, which is, I think, a 10-year deal? Yeah, there's no way to. Yeah. Right? There's no way to. Well, they take a plant that's in... Michigan and move it right. south to right. make up their profit someplace and, else. And we've even heard of mayor in Ohio, mayors and, and uh, city leaders and community leaders going against one another to try to lure one company from a neighboring suburb. It, it's happened in Cleveland. It's happened in Columbus. How about the tone, Kathy Kandisky? Donald Trump had a rally. It, yes. was, it looked like a campaign rally yes. in Cincinnati this week. Victory tour. He came and sang to Ohio. lap for him. The tone was, the scripted tone was presidential. The unscripted tone was still candidate Donald Trump. Well, I, you know, I think he was having some fun. I think he was he was relishing in it. I mean, he relived a lot of the election night during that speech. Um, he commented about how much fun it was to kind of beat Hillary as bad as he did. Um, Even it, though she's winning the popular vote and they, he didn't a mention that, fairly yeah. slim electoral <laughs> vote margin. I didn't hear that though, but, but that wasn't mentioned. So, you know, but he's entitled to take a victory lap. I was kind of expecting a little more substance on what his plans were in office because that's how he had dubbed that speech. Um, and I didn't think we got a lot of detail there. But we still, as Mark pointed out, and we're seeing cabinet picks this week, we're getting a glimpse of what the Trump presidency is going to look like. We did get the defense secretary names, sort of. He wasn't supposed, to, he wasn't supposed to say it, but it, that, he named his defense secretary last night. So there was some policy anyway. Well, it was uh, the release that came out said there was going to be a special announcement yeah. in Ohio. So this was kind of previewed, I think. All right. Let's get to the State House, the final weeks of the Ohio legislative session are typically a mad dash to move or kill controversial bills before a new General Assembly begins in January. Now, with less than a week before the lame duck session is expected to end, abortion restrictions, changes to unemployment benefits, and renewable energy mandates are still the big issues on the table. Kathy Kandisky, what's the big issue that may come out of this session, do you think? I think the unemployment compensation changes are probably the biggest because they're going to affect the most people. Um, the Republicans have introduced a new bill to shore up the fund, um, Ohio's fund, to prevent future borrowing in, in a downturn of the economy. Um, we got a financial note on the proposal this week that shows it's requiring a lot more in from employees in terms of cut benefits and a lot less from employers who will be paying more t higher taxes but not anywhere near what the employees are going to be cutting. Um, so that's going to have an effect. There's going to be fewer weeks of benefits available for people. There's going to be a freeze on the benefit amount until we reach a solvency level, which could be 10 years. And they're going to eliminate dependent payments. Ray Miller, you serve in the legislature. Is it easier to do this when the economy is fairly healthy and people are not filing for unemployment to cut benefits? And it's, it's an, always a bad thing to do to look at cutting benefits um, in the General Assembly. Um, I, I'm not sure what, where the leadership is going right now. Uh, everybody's playing the politics. I mean, just the way that I look at it. Mark, the, it's the Republican legislature, Republican governor, so there's not really a tra change in power. The majority stay about the same. Is there really an urgency for this legislature to finish to do stuff? when basically a lot of them are coming back, at least the same party leadership is coming back? It is, although Keith Faber's leaving as the president of the Senate to go to the House. I think the current leaders want to make sure that this problem with the solvency is resolved now. We're seeing other states, Illinois and California are two particular ones, where pension funds, unemployment compensation, other government-backed funds are falling apart, and the people who need the benefits won't get them unless we shore it up. I think it makes sense to do that. But the argument is the company should pay more as well as have the benefits cut. Can companies give a little more, Mark? I think I think each side can give more. I think we all need to recognize that unless the system is solvent, we're going to have a lot of people hurting. Green energy mandates, governor seems to like them. Legislature does not seem to like them. How does that play out? Well, in the next couple I, of weeks? I think if anything's going to happen in this legislative session, you know, the whole idea of the legislature would have two more Republicans in it starting in January, and the energy freeze that you're talking about does expire at the end of the year. So there's kind of a pressure to do something now. But if it doesn't get done, then starting over the process, if Governor Kasich were, ve were to veto something, 
the legislature arguably could override his veto. And so I, I'm, I'm looking to see what happens with that one. And one thing we haven't heard a whole lot about that we all expected to, I think, was charter schools and especially the online schools. We've got an ECOT situation coming up on Monday where they're having a hearing before the uh, Department of Education. So I'm, I'm just wondering if we're going to get to, in the short amount of time it's left, get to charter schools and, and uh, any transparency issues there. I don't think so. I mean, yeah. the e-schools are asking for a forgiveness of, of money that was overpaid to them because of atten attendance, inflated attendance. And I, everything I'm hearing is the legislature is not interested in doing that quite but yet. But those who are pro-charter schools uh, probably are heartened by the new education secretary that's been yes. uh, nominated. On the, on the federal um, on the federal Betsy DeVos. Yeah, yeah who, who, whose husband is the billionaire as well. Uh, and so uh, it, it's worth looking at the fines that uh, uh, that are owed by the companies and so forth that she's been associated with. All right, we gotta so it's going to be a mess. We've got to get to our off-the-record parting shots. Mark, we up first. There, the, the Ohio Senate majority is now 24. The newest senator will be former Navy SEAL Frank Hoagland from Eastern Ohio. He will bring a very interesting perspective to the Senate. Keep your eye on former Navy SEAL Frank Hoagland. Ray Miller. Um, I think the uh, Ohio Legislative Black Caucus has the largest number uh, of members that they have had. Uh, in the history uh, with three new African-American members, and so that's a po very positive thing. Okay. Karen? Well, I think buried in the Secretary of State's certification of the official results, there were a couple of interesting things here. For instance, uh, Hillary Clinton did win by eight counties, which I reported earlier this week. She did win uh, Lorraine County, which we didn't know on election night, and uh, that meant Donald Trump won 80 counties. He also won 30 counties by more than 70 percent of the vote. Mm -hmm. So that's a, he really improved on Mitt Romney's performance when he lost in 2012, and Hillary Clinton did not build much on Obama's. And Kathy? Uh, on, those, on the abortion front in the legislature, the heartbeat bill, which a lot of people don't want to see passed, may actually derail the 20-week ban. I think they're afraid to bring it up because they might amend the, try and amend the heartbeat bill into it, so we may not see as much change on the abortion front as we thought. Interesting. Well, on a lighter note, I don't want to jinx anyone, but there's a certain team that rides, that moves around on a smooth, slippery surface with thin metal blades on their feet that with <laughs> bent sticks that's doing well. Let's continue to do well without naming names. That's Columbus on the Record for this week. Check us out online, Facebook, Twitter, and WOSU.org. For our crew and for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.